Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Welcome to this next installment for Laurasian Institution Presents. Um, today's topic, of course, is Eras in Anime, from um, Nausicaa to Your Name and Beyond. Um, we're very excited for this presentation. Um, my name is Samantha Corpus. I am the Program Assistant at Laurasian Institution, based here in Seattle. Um, joining me is also my colleague, um, Yume Hidaka. Yume, you want to say hello there? Uh, ohayou gozaimasu. I'm connecting from Tokyo. Yeah, yeah and uh, Yume is the director um, of the Asian Institution. So thank you, Yume, for joining us. Um, uh, before we get started, I wanted to mention a couple um, housekeeping notes. Um, as I've mentioned before, we are recording this session. So if you would like to turn off your video or cover your camera, please do so. Um, if you have questions throughout, we will have time at the very end of the presentation for your um, questions. So please send them to me as a direct message so I can keep track of them and uh, uh, share them with the uh, presenter at the end. Um, and uh, yeah, so let me just do a quick introduction about Laurasian Institution. We are a nonprofit um, educational in, um, ed organization specializing in meaningful, high-quality exchange and education programs between the U.S. and Japan. We were founded in 1990, so we're coming up on a little over 30 years now, and we have been honored to operate programs sponsored with both the U.S. Department of State and the Japanese Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Our current programs, and some of our participants and uh, former participants are here actually, um, are the Japan Outreach Initiative, or JOY program, which focuses on cultural outreach, um, the Japanese Language Education Assistance Program, or JLEAP, which focuses on um, education, and uh, New Perspectives Japan, which is our short-term exchange trip for uh, middle schools and high school students to Japan. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about our programs, um, but uh, before we get into today's presentation, which I know everyone is very excited for, um, I'd like to just explain a little bit of background about uh, this series. Um, we actually only began this uh, monthly event series last fall as a means to connect with others who are interested in U.S.-Japan US relations as well as Jap Japanese culture, language, um, and exchange. Um, just with the ongoing coronavirus pandemic and the different challenges that have arisen throughout the past year, we really wanted to um, find a way to kind of bring uh, folks together through community, through sharing, um, in order to strengthen each other through these difficult times. Um, as a nonprofit group, of course, we've, um, we've definitely seen our fair share of challenge this past um, year or so. And so we also appreciate any support that you are able to give, whether it's a new idea for the next Laurasian Presents event, which we're always open to hearing ideas about, um, or if you are able to contribute any donation um, of any amount, we truly thank you from the bottom of our hearts for all that you can do for us. And we are so thrilled that we could be able to do this for you. Um, and so I'd like to introduce uh, today's presenter. He is close to our Villarasian family. Um, Gabriel Rebeck uh, holds degrees in both film and East Asian languages and cultures from the University of Kansas. His education includes an independent study with Dr. Michael Basket, who got his start in the film industry in Japan and later became the director of localization on hit games such as Chrono Trigger, Dino Gears, and Final Fantasy VII. After graduation, Gabriel spent 10 years living in Japan until he returned to the US to work as the Japan Programs Manager here at Laurasian Institution. So without further ado, I'll pass this over to Gabriel and uh, let, let him take us away. Oh, thank you, Gabe. Uh, thank you very much, Sam, and uh, thanks to you, May, as well. Uh, first off, I would like to express my gratitude to Laurasian Institution for giving me the opportunity to speak on this topic today. Um, and just to let you know a little bit more about myself first, uh, as Sam mentioned, I studied East Asian languages and cultures as well as film at the University of Kansas. And while many of my classmates moved out to LA to start working in the film industry, uh, I figured that as a middle-class white male, my story had been told in Hollywood enough, and so why not go travel the world and hear stories from other interesting people before starting to uh, work in film production myself. So I joined the JET program, uh, and I joined uh, JET and uh, lived in Kagoshima, Japan for three years, and then an additional seven years in Nagoya, Japan, where I worked for a private company at that point. 
Uh, after a decade in Japan, I returned to the US and I've been working on programs of academic exchange for Laurasian Institute ever since. And uh, while my career has taken me away from film, it has continued to be a passion of mine. So I'm very excited to be speaking about this topic with you today. And the two gentlemen that we will be mainly speaking about this evening are of course, the legend Hayao Miyazaki and contender to the throne, Makoto Shinkai. So, uh, Hayao Miyazaki and the world of Ghibli really need no introduction. Many of you may have grown up with him. For the uninitiated, I will take a, uh, I will take a quick look at uh, profiles from both filmmakers in just a moment. Um, but admittedly, I came to the Makoto Shinkai bandwagon just a little bit late, but I've been fascinated ever since. Uh, I saw the preview for your name. Uh, by the way, I'm gonna stick to English titles for all the films in this presentation for, you know, for speaking in English, so we'll stick with that. Um, I saw the preview for your name at a movie theater, knowing absolutely nothing about it at the time. Uh, and it, it looked nice, looked kind of cool. So I noted the release date and returned to my local Ichimaru Kyu Shinemazu movie theater on the weekend that it was to be released. Walked up to the box office, expecting to pick up two tickets and a bag of popcorn 10 minutes before the screening and was surprised to find out not only was it sold out for that showing, but sold out for the entire weekend and sold out for the next weekend as well. So I immediately wanted to know what the heck this movie was and why it was such a force to be reckoned with and why I was having this problem for your name and I didn't have the same problem for other uh, Ghibli releases in previous years, uh, movies like The Wind Rises, Tale of Princess Kaguya, When Marnie Was There, uh, etc. Uh, this was obviously a, a brand new thing and I, I wasn't sure where it was coming from, so I immediately wanted to know more. Um, and so that's exactly what I'd like to talk a little bit more about uh, this evening, is how Makoto Shinkai took influence from Hayao Miyazaki in many ways, some obvious, some not so obvious, to become the popular face of Japanese animation internationally, and how that position is currently being challenged by Demon Slayer. Uh, okay, anyway, so let's take a look at the profiles of these two filmmakers. So uh, Hayao Miyazaki, what can I say? He's the Walt Disney of Japan, co-founder of Studio Ghibli, uh, Academy Award, obviously for, uh, for Spirited Away in 2003, and then a, an additional Academy Honorary Award for his impact on animation and cinema in general in 2014, which is a very, very impressive distinction. He's the reason you're here if you're over 30. I, I wasn't sure exactly where to put that number, but uh, yeah, for the uh, older anime fans in the crowd, that's definitely the reason why you're here. Notable films, all of them, <laughs> all of them. His entire career is, is amazing. Obviously, Spirited Away was a really major uh, international success. Mononoke Hime uh, was the top uh, grossing movie in Japan until Titanic got over there. Um, everything is just, everything that he's done is really great. So uh, if you don't, if you haven't seen all of his films, check them out, absolutely. And, uh, and in this corner, Makoto Shinkai. He's a sensitive soul and a confirmed workaholic. This guy, he does everything on his films, including writing the novelizations of them. Uh, he's a major contributor to Comics Wave films. He's not actually a founder, which was uh, surprising to me. I didn't realize that until I was doing my research for this. Um, Your Name. So his film, Your Name, came out 2016, was an international smash hit, number one in many, many countries. Uh, it took a lot of people by surprise, including myself, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, won the Los Angeles Film Critics Association Award for Best Animation. Um, followed that up with Weathering With You, which became the highest grossing film in Japan 2019. He's the reason you're here if you're under 30, I might guess. I don't know. Uh, that's, uh, that's my assumption, but uh, again, not sure exactly where to put that age. Notable, notable films, Five Centimeters Per Second, The Garden of Words. Those were pretty big before his kind of big break. Your Name was Giant Smash and Weathering With You obviously was uh, not quite as big, but still a, a major, major success. Um, so saying that these two guys are similar is not a controversial stance in the least. Uh, the comparison between Miyazaki and Shinkai went pretty mainstream in Japan with an ad campaign by the Nishin Cup Noodle Company featuring a grown-up Kiki from Miyazaki's Kiki Delivery Service, drawn very much in the style of Shinkai. So kind of bringing those two worlds together. Uh, so I want to take a look at this little commercial. It's kind of interesting, especially if you're familiar with both of their styles. Uh, watch as Kiki even admits her love for Tombo. Scandal. All right, here we go. <laughs> Nagetanda so song. 
キキ17歳この気持ちうまくお届けできますか今青春に魔法がかかるトンボ届け物があるのキキ大好きハングリーダイズカップヌードル<笑>うわっUh, okay, so this commercial is not made by Shinkai or Comics Wave, but they did nail the style.、Uh, even the music is the band Bump of Chicken standing in to sound quite a bit like their contemporary、uh, artist, Rad Wimps.、Um, it's, it's just very interesting to, to me to see this kind of、uh, blending of the two worlds in an advertisement. I know it was actually pretty popular in Japan when it,、uh, when it came on TV. So, this is well tread territory.、Uh, in an interview with Kim Taylor Foster of Fandom, published in January of 2020, Makoto Shinkai said that Miyazaki's Laputa, Castle in the Sky, was one of the first films he ever saw and still his favorite. And then rounding out his other、uh, of his top three favorites are Naushka in the Valley of Wind and Castle of Cagliostro. Of course, all Miyazaki. So, Shinkai loves Ghibli and, and、uh, the films that they've made. So, again, Um, some influence is bound to exist. But I'm willing to bet that there are similarities that go beyond what most people can kind of easily see just by watching and enjoying those films. And in the spirit of appreciating both of these great artists, I'd like to explore those similarities a little bit more this evening. So,、uh, specifically, the areas where Shinkai seems to have taken influence from Miyazaki that I'd like to take a closer look at this evening are as follows、uh, Number one, imagery. Number two, music. Number three, themes. So, that's just about. Everything, things you see, things you hear, things you feel.、Uh, so, just to get a little bit more specific,、uh, detailed backgrounds、uh, using digital lighting effects and rotoscoping with simple but effective character designs, popular music combined with orchestral film score, and then repeating messages and social commentary across different films and prioritizing these themes over story. So, that's the kind of rough、uh, summary of what I want to talk about this evening. As a bit of a spoiler alert, the third section, the themes section, is where、uh, some of the most important similarities come in,、um, the, the not so obvious ones that you might be interested in. So stick with us.、Uh, and then that will also segue us into my final topic Demon Slayer, or how a shonen anime broke all of those records. Remember, I mentioned that they had top grossing、uh, film of all time in Japan, Spirited Away, Your Name. Demon Slayer has broken all of those records and is challenging the entire industry right now. So, I'm going to try to keep this accessible and entertaining by not throwing too many sources at you like a proper research paper should. So, this presentation comes with apologies to my professor and mentor, Dr. Basket. If time allows, I'd like to open up for some questions and comments at the end. I know the fan base is very passionate.、Uh, I grew up with Miyazaki. Shinkai might click a little better with younger people than me.、Uh, I'm expressing opinions in the form of analysis in this presentation, but I would love to interact with you if your interpretations are different from mine. Um, and finally, as a, a real spoiler alert, I'm going to discuss、uh, light story points from Your Name and Spirited Away, and then heavier story points from Weathering with You and The Wind Rises. So I like to think that my analysis will、uh, help you appreciate these films. So I encourage you to stick with me, even if you haven't seen all of them. They're works of art, they're wine, not milk. They don't spoil.、Uh, anyway, let's start digging into the fun stuff. Imagery. So, if I ask you to think of a Makoto Shinkai film, what imagery comes to your mind? I'll give you a second to picture it in your head. Okay, you got it? I'm guessing that everybody either thought of A, picture perfect, meticulously animated renderings of the buildings and city streets of Tokyo, equally as beautiful as they are intimidating and alienating in their size and complexity, or B, Impossibly dramatic skies that perfectly mirror the tumultuous emotions and feelings of young people experiencing the pain and joy of falling madly in love for the first time. Did I get it? Am I right? Was it one of those?、Uh, <laughs> somewhere in between, maybe.、Um, to develop,、uh, to, to get a better idea of how Shinkai developed this kind of visual style,、uh, I want to take a look at his first film. So, Makoto Shinkai started his career making cutscenes for video games at a company called Falcom. This is where he learned digital tools for animation that he quickly put to use in a short film called She and Her Cat. It's black and white and not even five minutes long, but visual, it's, visually, it's immediately recognizable as Shinkai's work. Detailed buildings, dramatic skies, clouds, and weather. 
The short was created in black and white to save time and money needed for rendering and then distributed on burned CDRs, very rock and roll, though the short is actually quite fragile and emotional as with most of Shinkai's work. Uh, I like this little short film because you can see a lot of the visual hallmarks of Shinkai's style well before he had the support of a studio or a feature film budget. This is indie anime filmmaking. I'd like to show you just a portion of the film now. Uh, I'm afraid I don't have English subtitles for it, but we're looking more at the visuals here. The story is narrated by the cat. Basically, the cat has fallen, fallen in love with his owner, and uh, the owner kind of in the background is going through a difficult situation, maybe a breakup or something. Uh, let's, uh, but, but more so, just please uh, take a look at the style. And you'll, if you're familiar with Shinkai's work, I think it'll be pretty recognizable. So let's take a look. だから彼女の髪も僕の体も重く締める。地軸が音もなく悲惨と回転して彼女と僕の体温は世界の中で静かに熱を失い続けていた。その日僕は彼女に拾われた。だから僕は彼女の猫だ。彼女は母親のように優しく。I fell in love with her. <laughs> um, so even with this rudimentary work, we can see two main characteristics of Shinkai's style. Painted photographs to create extremely detailed backgrounds and 3D modeling to create digital lighting and shadow effects, adding even more detail that would be very complicated to produce by hand. So I want to go back and take a quick look at, uh, well, so let's see. This image of the door. So watch the shadow in the background and then the little piece of the, I guess it's a window that you can see opening in the foreground. If you watch that sort of move. That's a, that's a 3D model used over 2D animation to sort of create this uh, deeper depth of field in the, in the image there. Uh, so that's that's 3D modeling for sure, combined with the 2D animation. Uh, this is a digital effect for sure, the, the raindrops and something that he would go back to many times in his career. Um, I don't know, I don't know why, but this one just shouts out to me that this is a photograph that's painted over. I mean, I think this is definitely uh, something anybody that's lived in Japan has had a very similar uh, uh, piece in their kitchen. I think it's immediately recognizable for most people. Um, so a lot of detail goes into the backgrounds, whereas by comparison, the woman and her cat have significantly less detail. Let me try to find that real quick here. There you go. Um, especially when they move, uh, which isn't very often either. So these are the basics of animation, um, which I suspect everybody basically already understands. To create motion, you need to create 24 frames every second, whereas a single background image can be you know, stationary throughout an entire shot. Therefore, it's much easier to put a lot of detail into the backgrounds. Uh, that's why the backgrounds of uh, the Flintstones actually have texture, and then Fred and Wilma are all solid colors. Did I lose the kids with a Flintstones reference? I'll win you back by showing you just a little bit of the Your Name trailer next. Uh, please keep those detailed backgrounds and lighting and shadow effects in mind when you watch this. So this is Shinkai's breakout film, Your Name. あの日星が降った日それはまるで
Uh, so you, it's, I don't know, it's really cool animation. I think even if you, you know the story, you don't know the story, whatever, it's cool animation to see. I did want to point out back here closer to the beginning, uh, we saw Nishi Shinjuku, Let me find it real fast. Um, so, so this is where you get those rotoscoped images. This is an actual location in Japan um, and it looks spot on. We're gonna actually take a look at a comparison in just a second. Um, but so he's used rotoscoping to make this look just, you know, really realistic in animation, but also lighting effects for the sun coming up in the background and the shadows coming in. Even, even uh, the, they're um, making it look like there's a lens that's taking this. So there's little spots on the, on the lens. Uh, it's no wonder that J.J. Abrams wants to produce the, uh, the Hollywood version of this, J.J. Lens Flare Abrams. Um, so you can see the, the 3D modeling coming in here to create those lighting effects. There's even more here with the shrine. So watch the, the light coming through the trees. Do you see that these light, these light streams of light coming in through the trees? That's definitely 3D models to create that effect. Um, and I, I think it's just gorgeous. I think it's really beautiful. Um, with uh, these very public settings that, uh, that are in your name, we get a chance to compare the animated work to their real life counterparts, which is pretty cool. Uh, there you go. Uh, that's Nishi Shinjuku on the left. Spot on. It looks exactly the same. And then uh, on the right, those are the, that's the staircase up to the platform to the train from Nagoya Station to Gifu Nakatsugawa. So not only is this the correct station, but it's the right train line and the right platform number to go to Gifu where the character is heading in the story at this point. And I happen to see this uh, film in a theater right next to Nagoya Station. Uh, and in this short blink if you miss it shot, when that popped up on screen, the audience gasped. It's immediately recognizable and people were thrilled to see their humble station re represented on screen. So she and her cat showed us that he started this technique, this super detailed realistic technique early in his career and he continues to wow audiences with this amazing level of detail in every new film he creates. And when I asked you to picture that uh, Shinkai film in your mind, I'm a, I'd be willing to bet that a lot of you had a lot of uh, detail in that image that you were imagining. Uh, Shinkai is actually credited as the photographer on Garden of Words, Your Name, Weathering With You. He takes these reference photos that they then paint over uh, and almost certainly did so in his earlier works as well, despite not being credited. Um, that apartment in She and Her Cat is probably his apartment. That kettle was probably his kettle. Uh, and what Shinkai brought to the world of animation is this effective use of painting over photos uh, combined with the 3D, 3D modeling technology to create even more detail through lighting and shadow effects. But the act of drawing over photographs to achieve realism in animation is hardly new. It's actually a technique called rotoscoping that was invented in 1915 by Max Fleischer, famous animator known for Betty Boop, Popeye, Superman cartoons, etc. Fleischer had a patent on this technique that expired in 1934 just in time for a young go-getter animator by the name of Walt Disney to use this technique on his first feature-length animated film, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, and of course, many, many films after that. Yeah, some of that uh, still exists too. It's kind of, see, kind of cool to see the, the production techniques from that era. Um, but you don't necessarily need to paint over pictures to get amazing detail. All you really need is good quality reference photos. There's no better source than real life to try to create a real life picture, right? So guess whose films are famous for taking heavy influence from real world locations? That's right, the man we've been neglecting to talk about for the last couple of minutes, Hayao Miyazaki. Uh, you can book package tours to go visit the locations that served as inspirations for many of Ghibli's films. 
Um, so for example, uh, Colmar, France was the inspiration for a location in uh, Howl's Moving Castle. You can see the buildings are spot on. This one over here, like this tower, that's, that's an actual location in that town. Kiki's Delivery Service, uh, Visbon, Sweden. You can kind of see the buildings look very similar. That served as the, the inspiration there. There's actually uh, a couple of different locations that they used for that one. But if you go to this town in Visbon, um, you can find a bunch of locations that they used for backgrounds for this film. You could go on a little Kiki's Delivery Service tour if you wanted. Another one, Princess Mononoke, they used Yakushima, Japan. Of course, a, a World Heritage Site, absolutely beautiful. It's, it's a forest island mountain thing. If you get the opportunity to go, I absolutely recommend, I think everybody should see this place once and it's spot on in the film. It looks, it's almost hard to tell which one is the picture and which one's the, you know, animation here. Um, and then perhaps most famous uh, Spirited Away, Jifuan, uh, Taiwan. There's obviously a big bathhouse there that you can visit. The area around it is kind of this retro town and that served very much as the inspiration for the, the atmosphere of, of that, uh, that particular film. Um, yeah, these get pretty detailed. <laughs> they, they take a lot of details. Not only does Ghibli take a lot of uh, details from the photos that they take, but then the fans obsess over them a little bit too. So look into that if you wanna know a little bit more about the actual locations that served as the inspirations for these films, because it's a fascinating topic. I recommend uh, you look into it if you, if you wanna learn more about it. Um, but this point reminds me of the time that I brought a friend of mine someone unfamiliar with the world of Ghibli to a movie theater to see Spirited Away back when it came out uh, in the summer of 2002 in the United States. It was a big deal. Up until that time, anime films never really got wide releases at major movie theaters in the US. Uh, I took my friend to see it and believe it or not, the theater was relatively empty, uh, just a couple of other small groups. This was before it was even nominated for the Academy Award. Anyway, two or three minutes into the film, probably around the time of the scene that you see on the screen right now, my friend looked at me with sort of a concerned face uh, and, and she whispered to me, why did the backgrounds look like real life and the characters look like Saturday morning cartoons? I wasn't really sure how to respond to that. However, near the end of the film, when Haku and Chihiro are falling through the sky and Chihiro realizes Haku's identity is the Kohaku River spirit, my friend was in tears. My friend was in tears at the end of this story. So much for Saturday morning cartoons. So using real life reference photos and rotoscoping to put details and realism into animations is not a technique invented by either Miyazaki or Shinkai or even Disney for that matter. Though I believe they both do it very well and Shinkai has taken it to the next level by incorporating those 3D modeling techniques to create uh, lighting and shadow effects. Uh, I certainly see similarity though I'm not saying that Shinkai has stolen anything from Miyazaki here well, except maybe for his early film Children Who Chase Lost Voices this one's basically a Ghibli film from start to finish. Watch it, it's interesting. Uh, so music. Uh, when talking about the music that accompanies Makoto Shinkai's work, of course, one name comes to mind. Tenmon. What, were you expecting someone else? Yes, Tenmon or Shirakawa Atsushi composed all of the beautiful heartfelt music for Shinkai's early work up until he became famous. Yes, Tenmon is the Pete best of our story. Tenmon did the lovely piano piece that you heard earlier during uh, She and Her Cat, but uh, Shinkai elected to part ways with Tenmon for his film Garden of Words and go with another composer, Daisuke Kashiwa, because he was trying to find a film, or trying to find a sound that was quote, unlike other anime. Uh, I feel both Tenmon and after him Kashiwa both composed good music for Shinkai, lovely and lush and delicate, fragile and nostalgic. Uh, they have their individual styles, but they were definitely living in the shadow of the giants of the industry, and most specifically, Joe Hisaishi, the man responsible for all of Miyazaki's film scores. And perhaps Shinkai recognized this, recognized you know, that they weren't fully bringing an original sound, uh, because when he set to work writing his next film, Your Name, he was still looking for a new musical collaborator, someone who could make his films sound unlike other anime. So as soon as that film got the green light, he reached out to one of his favorite bands, Radwimps, and the rest is history.
It's hard to stop that one. Um, the soundtrack for Your Name was also a smash hit. It was number one in Japan, certified gold from the Recording Industry Association of Japan, peaked at number 15 on the Billboard Soundtrack Albums Chart, number two on the Billboard World Albums Chart. You couldn't go 15 seconds without hearing that song on the radio. Uh, ironically, by going in a different direction and reaching out to a rock band to create the musical score for his films, uh, Shinkai managed to give Your Name something that Joe Hisaishi had been creating for Miyazaki for years, actually. Something Shinkai's films had been lacking up to that point. A popular theme song. Yes, Shinkai's early films had main themes, uh, but never a good old-fashioned earwig theme song. I'm talking about this. All right, who started singing? <laughs> or this. <laughs> or for the more uh, mature films that he created, something like this. <laughs> Another difficult one to stop. <clears throat> uh, Shinkai's work was missing radio-friendly pop songs, so he reached out and found himself a pop artist in Rad Wimps and Yojiro Noda, the lead singer who really gave the perfect voice to Shinkai's work, I feel. Uh, all of those songs and indeed all of the music in Miyazaki's whole filmography were, uh, were written by the genius Joe Hisaishi. Uh, pictured here with a young fan. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Actually, that's Miyazaki. <laughs> In the right on that picture, that is a young Hayao Miyazaki clean shaven. This is 1988, so most likely they are working on Kiki's Delivery Service or Totoro at this point. I absolutely love this picture. I had to include it in this presentation. Um, so saying that Hisaishi's strong point is making pop songs is like saying that the best part of a birthday cake is the candles. That's one small aspect of his work. Miyazaki and Hisaishi are one of the legendary partnerships. He's the John Williams to Miyazaki's Steven Spielberg. Studio Ghibli weaves dreams and fantasy worlds. Joe Hisaishi provides those worlds, their atmosphere, the air you breathe when you're watching the films. Uh, they just wouldn't be the same without his music. If I had any capacity to talk about film theory here, I would, but I have no idea how he composes music in a major key while still giving it a beautiful pang of melancholic nostalgia. Though, to be perfectly fair, uh, as I pointed out earlier that rotoscoped animation has been around since the early days of Walt Disney, the opening song for Totoro, Aruko, Aruko, Watashi wa Genki, is basically the Mickey Mouse march. But anyway, uh, just as classical composer, uh, a classical composer such as Hisaishi stretched his talent to make pop songs for Miyazaki, 
Noda and Radwimps stretched their talent to provide a proper orchestral score for Shinkai. They didn't just make an album of 12 rock songs to set the movie to. Uh, there's a very exciting upbeat montage in the film Your Name where that Radwimp song that I just played a moment ago is played. Um, but then in the, in the scene directly following that, we get a really lovely piece of musical score composed by Noda that sounds very much like the work of Hisaishi. Let's take a quick listen to that right here. This is the music the, that plays while the grandmother is explaining the concept of musubi, the interconnectedness of all things. Yes, this was written by the young gentleman we saw jumping around in the field earlier wearing the hat. Uh, I was very impressed that these talented radical wimps managed to do a proper orchestral score, including some in uh, really interesting surreal kind of songs, including the rock songs that they did for the soundtrack. Um, and so this track that we just listened to is lacking the kind of piano and woodwinds of a Hisaishi composition but uh, it does sound very much like a young composer studying at the feet of the master. So speaking of Hisaishi, let's just take a quick listen to one of his scores as well. I included this clip uh, really just because it gives me goosebumps every time. That's the real reason why I popped this in here. <laughs> um, but while uh, Radwimp's orchestral arrangements really have yet to reach this level, in their defense, Joe Hisaishi has never written anything that rocks quite as much as the Your Name soundtrack. So, uh, after the smash hit of Your Name, the movie and the soundtrack, Shinkai, and Rad, uh, Shinkai asked Radwimp's to score his next film, Weathering With You. It wasn't quite as popular as your name, but uh, the soundtrack did, soundtrack did hit number one on the charts and was certified gold. Uh, I personally enjoyed it quite a bit. Shinkai has yet to announce if he will continue this professional relationship with Rad Wimps in, the ne in his next film, uh, but I'm sure that many hope that he will. And I wish all the best of luck to Tenmon, whatever he's doing right now. Uh, Joe Hisaishi created the soundtracks to many people's childhoods. Uh, with two films down, Rad Wimps aren't quite on that level yet, but they're certainly on their way, or at least to creating the soundtrack to people's adolescence. Repetition of themes. So this is where we're gonna get just a little bit controversial, but follow me on this. So the prototypical Shinkai film is about young love that builds so strong that it's painful. The difficulty of communication, either across time or space, weather mirroring emotions. There are going to be trains and power lines involved, and hopefully by the end, the boy and the girl will get over themselves and finally fall in love. I mentioned at the start of this presentation that Shinkai's work might click a little more with people younger than myself, so forgive me when I say this, but I feel his themes are stronger than his stories. Now, finding plot holes is extremely lazy film criticism, 
But it, critics, many critics did point out that uh, a few threads in the plot of Weathering With You are basically left dangling. And I admit that during the third act of Your Name, I was enjoying the build to the emotional climax, um, but at the same time, I was also sort of scratching my head thinking, that's the direction that they went with the story? Okay. Uh, not bad, but just maybe, maybe a little bit different from what I imagined it might have been. In all of Shinkai's films, the characters are strong and well-defined with emotions and fleshed out backstories, which makes it compelling to watch them fall in love. I believe the reason why these films resonated so much with so many people is more so because of the emotions and these themes than the stories themselves. Now that having been said, the prototypical Miyazaki film is about the complex balance between humanity and nature, environmentalism, war, innocence, and childhood, coming of age. There are going to be old fashioned aeronautics and planes involved and somebody's hair will slowly start to float up as they speak passionately about something. Hayao Miyazaki and Makoto Shinkai have spent their respective, respective careers circling around a few key themes that they weave into their films over and over again. And if any of the super fans in the audience are getting angry at me right now, please understand I do not see this as a bad thing. The stories might have some trouble, but the characters, the worlds they build, and the themes that they establish still make these films strong and very sophisticated. I mentioned that I came to the Shinkai bandwagon a little bit late, but I saw my first Miyazaki film at the age of 12. A teacher of mine lent me a Japanese VHS videotape of Princess Mononoke. No subtitles, no English at all, that release hadn't happened yet. Uh, I had just started memorizing my hiragana with flashcards on my own, but I, I couldn't understand a word in the movie. I loved it all the same. To this day, it's my favorite of the Ghibli catalog. The strength of emotion in the imagery and the sound were sufficient to convey enough of the idea of that film to me, so much so that I'm talking to you about it 20 years later today. Uh, during a press conference that Miyazaki gave in Paris before the first European screening of Spirited Away in 2001, Miyazaki was asked if it's true that his films are made without a script. His response was, that's true. I don't have the story finished and ready when we start work on a film. I usually don't have the time. So the story develops when I start drawing the storyboards. The production starts very soon thereafter while the storyboards are still developing. He continues, we never know where the story will go, but we just keep working on the film as it develops. It's a dangerous way to make an animation film, and I would like it to be different, but unfortunately, that's the way I work, and everyone else is kind of forced to subject themselves to it. A little bit humble about that. Um, but this tells me that the strongest element of the creative process for Miyazaki is the imagery. Everything starts from the storyboards. The feelings and themes of the story start there and are fleshed out and discovered later in the script. Uh, later in the same press conference, Miyazaki also said, I'm not a storyteller, I'm a man who draws pictures. And then he laughed. Now, I personally would uh, refute that. I would call Miyazaki a master storyteller all the same, but it's no wonder that Miyazaki repeats themes, the themes and feelings that exist, uh, the themes are feelings that exist in the pictures that he likes to draw. So one could make the argument that real life doesn't follow standard story structures either, and that what Miyazaki and Shinkai are both doing is uh, creating stories that are more like real life without clear good guys and bad guys and three act structures. And I totally agree with that. I, I definitely appreciate that interpretation, but I still feel that both directors' real strengths lie in their themes and social commentary that come through those themes. For example, in Shinkai's Weathering With You, the female lead Hina discovers that she is a sunshine girl. She has the magical ability to make the sun come out on rainy days. However, in doing this, they throw off the balance of nature and rain starts to fall nonstop, heavier and heavier. Hina decides that the only way to stop the rain and return the weather to normal is to sacrifice herself and go to heaven up in the clouds. But over the course of the film, the male lead, Hodaka, falls madly in love with Hina. And when he wakes up to find that Hina has left without him to sacrifice herself to stop the rain, he runs after her. He's chased at gunpoint by the police, but still he keeps running after her. 
He arrives at the rooftop shrine that could transport him up into the sky where he could find Hina and attempt to stop her self-sacrifice. Uh, just in choosing to even try and stop Hina, Hodaka is saying, let the rain fall forever. Let the floodwaters pull all of Tokyo down into the sea. I don't care. I just want to see her one more time. This is a bold reversal of the standard societal praise of self-sacrifice for the greater good, and specifically a strong rebuking of the standard Japanese idea of social harmony, the idea that someone should be prepared for some self-sacrifice in order for society to run smoothly and peacefully, the so-called wa. In this case, Hina wants to sacrifice in order to stop the rain for everyone, but Hodaka is willing to let Tokyo fall into the ocean so that he can be with the girl he loves. And while the story has to chug along pretty hard to set the scenario up, I believe it's an extremely effective statement of one of Shinkai's key themes. Let the rain fall forever for all I care. I just wanna be with the person I love. Whether Hodaka is effective in stopping Hina and her sacrifice, or if any of that was even real to begin with, I will leave for you to find out and interpret uh, for yourself upon watching the film. I recommend it. Another example, in Miyazaki's The Wind Rises, we get the story of Jiro Horikoshi, the man who designed the Mitsubishi A5M fighter plane, better known as the Zero or the plane used in frontline air combat in World War II, and also one of the vehicles that was used for kamikaze suicide attack missions later in the war. The Wind Rises is an interesting film because it took Miyazaki's usual themes out of their fantasy worlds that he usually creates and put them into a real life context of pre-war pre Japan. The film's a little bit more of a biography, uh, so the story is a little bit more straightforward. It's the events of a man's life. Uh, Horikoshi loved planes ever since he was a child and dreamed of becoming an aircraft designer. We see him go to school, graduate, and eventually find work at Mitsubishi, manufacturing other people's airplane designs. The whole time, he hopes to design his own dream plane. That's all he thinks about. He dreams about it and meets his, uh, his heroes in plane design in his dreams at night. And while things become more complicated with the war, he finally gets his chance to design his own plane for Mitsubishi. Now, to understand this film a little bit better, we need to look at the sound design. Uh, we obviously see a lot of airplanes in this movie, uh, and the majority of the sounds made by these airplanes are provided by people's mouths. Uh, unlike some Hollywood film where they would have, you know, Dolby digital DTS sounds of real planes, they've got sounds of people going and to make the sounds of the airplanes. I'm not even joking. In fact, Miyazaki himself, uh, who probably played with a lot of toy planes as a kid, wanted to record those sounds himself. Originally, Miyazaki wanted to have all of the sound effects voiced and he wanted to do them himself, said Jeff, we Jeff Wexler of Studio Ghibli. Um, so watch this clip, try to catch the sound of the airplane being made by somebody's mouth. It's kind of a, I think it's kind of a, I think it's kind of a <laughs> sound. <laughs> try to catch it, it's very interesting. Were you able to hear it? I know it's not, it's not super clear. It's not uh, the easiest to catch, but let me get right back about here. Close up on the engine so you can hear it going. It's, it's a couple of different sounds combined, but clearly you can hear in there. Try to listen. So this is Horikoshi in his dream plane that he dreamed of designing when he was a child. Uh, oh, my lights turned off here. This child's play fun approach to the sound design continues throughout the film until Horikoshi finally gets the chance to see the plane that he spent his entire life dreaming to design and build flying for the first time. 
we see not only one of his plane, but a whole fleet in military formation of what he created, the Japanese Navy Zeros rocketing across the sky. And this is played in complete silence. There's no, uh, this is no longer his childhood passion. He has created machines of war. Regardless of, uh, regardless of his intentions in building these planes, the fate of the machines and the pilots in them were now out of Horikoshi's hands. Miyazaki's themes in this film, the innocence of childhood, the brutality of humanity, and the senselessness of war come up in arguably every one of Miyazaki's works as a director, spanning his career of over four decades. And the feeling that you get when these warplanes silently race across the sky is so strong because it's bigger than the story of Horikoshi. It's an idea that Miyazaki has been expressing for his entire life. These themes, these ideas are bigger than the story of any one film. And that's the reason why, for those familiar with Miyazaki's work, this image right here, this Studio Ghibli logo, can get an emotional response because the man behind this image has built a body of work, a career that speaks very clearly to what he holds important as an artist. Now Makoto Shinkai has really come into his own over the last two or three feature films that he's made, finding a way to combine his harder science fiction elements uh, from his early work with uh, his interpersonal human drama that he seems to gravitate towards quite a bit. Um, and he's really found his own voice and I have no doubt that he will continue drawing on those same themes. And uh, I look forward to watching him incorporate these themes over and over again as he uh, grows those ideas throughout his career to come. Because beyond imagery, beyond animation, beyond any kind of techniques, music, or filmmaking tools, this is what Makoto Shinkai learned from watching the career of his hero, Miyazaki. Not how to create an animated film, but how to create a body of work that shares your perspective on the world and what you hold dear, how to have a career as an artist. Okay, cue the Demon Slayer music. <laughs> so I'm gonna wrap this up shortly, but uh, this discussion would not be complete without mentioning Demon Slayer, Kimetsu no Yaiba. Uh, so anyway, for anyone unaware, Demon Slayer is a manga currently being adapted into an animated series by UFO Table. It's a shonen manga, meaning targeted mostly towards young boys, largely Monster of the Week style episodes uh, with longer story arcs. Think Dragon Ball, Naruto, One Piece. Uh, UFO Table has been producing the series since 2019 and released a feature film in the summer of 2020, Mugen Train, continuing the story from the series. The reason why we're talking about this after talking about Shinkai and Miyazaki is this film broke all of those box office records that I mentioned earlier in this presentation. This is now the number one movie of all time in Japan, far surpassing Spirited Away, far surpassing Your Name, surpassing Titanic or any Star Wars film for that matter, all during the time of COVID. Uh, Demon Slayer is everywhere right now. The theme song is as popular as, well, Rad Wimp's Your Name soundtrack was a couple of years ago. Uh, that's singer Lisa belting out that song on the red and white show over the New Year's holiday. Uh, above that is Matsuko Deluxe interviewing some Demon Slayer cosplayers. Even Sanma-san on the right, at 64 years old, one of Japan's most popular TV personalities, was caught reading Demon Slayer on the train and admitted that he's been obsessed with the series. Um, since the success of Mugen Train, many long-running and beloved shonen manga and anime have also announced upcoming feature films. Uh, shocking everybody, Slam Dunk just recently announced that they'll be releasing a new film in 2021 after almost 25 years dormant. Uh, Evangelion 3.0 plus 1.0 is to be released in 2021 as well. To be honest, I don't really know what that is. Evangelion kind of left me behind a long time ago, um, but it's a big deal. Detective Conan as well. Uh, he was turned into a child about 30 years ago. He should be an adult by now, but he's going strong. 
and even legendary show Joe, young girls anime, Sailor Moon uh, is coming back to the movie theaters uh, next year. Lots of IPs are getting, the, getting in on this film craze. I think we're gonna see this for a little while. However, the Japanese market is funny. And at a time when Netflix and other streaming services are bringing major Hollywood releases into people's homes in the US, Japan has yet to fully embrace streaming. DVD and comic rental shops like Geo and Staya dealing in physical media are ubiquitous around Japanese train stations and even out in the countryside as well. In 2010, when Blockbuster Video finally closed down in the US, the DVD rental shop Staya made 113 million US dollars in profit, according to the website of their parent company, Culture Convenience Club. As of March 2020, Staya had 130 million US dollars in operating capital. That's just this year. Granted, it's, uh, well, it was before COVID. They probably are doing even more business now. Uh, so they've been holding out strong against streaming for a long time. But my big prediction is that uh, for the future of Japan, they will finally come around and embrace streaming in the next couple of years. Uh, it's slowly starting now with TV stations putting their shows onto Hulu and Tiver. Uh, personally, my Japanese mother-in-law signed up for Netflix because she heard how many Korean dramas are on there. And contrary to image, Japan takes a while to adapt to new technologies, but they do get there eventually. So while Demon Slayer Mugen Train uh, it may be, feeling, uh, may be thrilling to watch on the IMAX movie screen, the film would not have been the hit that it was if the TV series hadn't laid that groundwork first. UFO Table took an already great manga series and really elevated it with, an exciting act with exciting action sequences, great music, and even 3D modeling mixed with 2D animation, such as what we were talking about with uh, Makoto Shinkai earlier. The movie is easy to point to as a box office record breaking success, but the series' real accomplishment, the series, the TV series, is the real accomplishment here. So my prediction is that after a short-term bump in animated feature films, copying Demon Slayer, getting on the Mugen train, for the next year or so, uh, you'll see much more sustained period of new quality animated TV series being produced and consumed via streaming services. Uh, there's already a number of quality series being produced, such as the ones you see here. Um, the similarity most of these share with Shinkai's work is effective use of 3D modeling blended with 2D animation uh, that allows for cool lighting and uh, light lighting and details, but uh, also really dramatic camera movements. Uh, I'm sure fans are happy to see some of their, their favorites up here, but uh, I think these are definitely going to continue on uh, for years to come and lead that new uh, renewed interest in streaming in Japan. Now, that all having been said, I am much, much more interested in the next films of Shinkai and Miyazaki. Shinkai is uh, near the start of, Shinkai is still near the start of his career, and he doubtless has many more quality works still ahead of him. And uh, the master Miyazaki has indeed come out of retirement, again, to release another film in the next year or so titled, How Do You Live? Uh, I'm not really sure how this is going to bear, how this is going to fare in the box office, or if it will defeat Demon Slayer, or if Slam Dunk is going to have some big showing at the box office. I don't know, and quite frankly, I don't really care. Uh, I, I know that it will have the Miyazaki level of quality that I expect, and that he has built as an artist over his career, and that's why I'm going to be the first person in line when this gets released. So anyway, thank you very much everyone today for your kind attention. Uh, I'd be very happy to take a, a couple of questions if we wanna spend just a little bit of time doing that uh, or, or perhaps some comments if anybody has them. Sam, have we been uh, watching those come in in the chat? Yes, we got a couple of questions earlier on. Um, and again, if you have questions, please send them to me as a direct message. It's a little easier for me to track them in the, uh, the chat box. Um, so one question, uh, it's a little bit of an easier one for you, Gabe. Um, uh, Catherine asked, um, where can you find the film that she and her cat, the, um, <laughs> the early Makoto Shinkai film? Um, I believe you told me you could find it on YouTube, but I might be mistaken. There's uh, a yes. lot of difference. Oh. Indeed. Uh, it, it appears that the film is actually on, uh, on Shinkai's old YouTube channel, which he, which he put up before he got very big. Um, if you search she and her cat, You'll find the Japanese title. It's actually Kanojo to Kanojo no Neko. If you have the capability of inputting that in your computer, you can just search for that on YouTube and it'll pop right up. 
um, or if you just search for it, uh, the, the Japanese should come up as well. You can copy and paste that into a, uh, into a, a YouTube search and it'll pop right up. It's, it's pretty easy to find. Uh, I, I want to take just half a second here because I've, I've stopped my screen share and I can see that uh, Diane Doherty has joined us. She, she's actually the one that I mentioned earlier that lent me that VHS copy of Princess Mononoke many years ago. So big thanks to you, Diane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sam, any other questions? Sharing. Yep. Um, so we have another question. Um, a, a viewer wants to know your thoughts about Director Hosoda. Um, if there's time for you to talk about it. Um, they loved Boy and the Beast and they wanted to know your thoughts. Yeah, there's there's a lot of interesting work that's being done kind of in that vein right now. And I think that's, that's definitely a, a good one. Uh, you know, I don't really have an interesting take to share with you at the moment. Um, why, why don't you uh, connect with me? You know what, I'll, I'll share my LinkedIn here in just a moment and, uh, and you can uh, interact with me uh, after, after this presentation. I'm afraid I don't have anything quite uh, uh, worthy of sharing to the audience right now. So I'd, I'd rather not uh, give you a hot take right now, but I do, I think is, is really interesting work and, and nice to see a lot of that uh, caliber of animation being produced in the last decade or so. Yeah, and I can grab that uh, link as well, Gabe, unless you've got that handy at this very moment. Uh, sure, if you'd um, like to do it, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah, I'm just looking for it again in all of my different notes, um, but we do have a few more questions here. So um, another one, uh, viewer, um, this is actually my one of our uh, current participants on the Joy program. Um, she says, thank you for this lecture, Gabe San. I think people um, stay at home more because of um, COVID and have a chance to watch anime or read manga more than before. Do you think the COVID situation helped Demon Slayer in its popularity? In, a, um, in another way, um, is it the environment that affected um, its popularity more so than the content itself, I guess, is the way the direction that the question's asking. It's a, it's a very interesting question. Um, I, I think certainly COVID might have uh, bumped or given a little bump to the series, the manga and the, uh, the TV series, that's for sure. But the reason why I wanted to include it in this presentation is the fact that it broke all those box office records. Is, it still boggles my mind, again, in the time of COVID people showed up at the movie theater to buy tickets, to sit in a room and, and watch this with a bunch of people. Um, so there's, there's definitely some yes and definitely some no in, in the answer to that because it, it definitely lent to the, the success of the series. But then I don't, I don't think that the film would have been as successful if it hadn't you know, really delivered on the goods uh, in the end. Uh, and that again goes to the, uh, the quality that UFO Table has been putting into both the series, but then also the actual film itself. Um, like I said, they really elevated a lot of the scenes from the manga. Well, one example that I can, uh, I can give is that uh, Bakayashiki scene. There's a scene where, where they're in this, uh, this house. It's kind of a haunted house kind of thing. And the guy's got uh, drums in his body and he can change the way that the room is situated by hitting the drums. And in the manga, of course, it's just stationary images, but they used that 3D modeling that we were talking about with Shinkai to really make you feel like you're losing your you know, equilibrium. And every time this room spins around in a different direction, um, you, you really lose your balance and you get, get a feel for how the, the main character is trying to deal with this fight. And so I think, I think there's a lot of quality there. And so um, just saying that, uh, that COVID kind of lent to the success, I think uh, does a little bit of a disservice to the, to the quality of the work being done, but it's definitely an interesting situation that I think it's always gonna be kind of a footnote and kind of an interesting sidebar to the story of why was this such a big uh, success when we're talking about it in, in years to come. Yeah, certainly. I'm, I mean, 2020 and now even 2021 will be historic no matter, uh, no matter what um, you're looking at in terms of the history. Um, we have another question. Um, do you have any other thoughts about Tao Miyazaki's son, Jiro, um, and some of his work? <laughs> yeah, so, so Goro, he's, uh, I don't know, Tales oh, from Earthsea. Yeah, it's, it's um, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm glad that he's doing it. <laughs> so actually, a really interesting thing that I almost included in the presentation but uh, elected to leave out is actually Ghibli just produced their first ever uh, 3D CG animated film uh, competing with the sort of Disney Pixar, uh, um, you know, films that are all 3D CG at this point that was uh, supposed to premiere at Cannes this year, but uh, because of COVID, obviously that didn't happen. So they just premiered it on NHK on, uh, on December 30th. Um, 
I haven't actually gotten a chance to see it myself. To be honest, I feel like the, the, the animation looks a little bit stiff. Uh, I think Ghibli is trying something new with this 3D CG. And as the studio that's really made a name for themselves of keeping traditional 2D animation alive, it's an interesting experiment. And I don't know, I, I really can't, again, I probably shouldn't give you my hot take because I haven't seen the film itself, but the animation that I've seen in the trailer seems just a little bit stiff. And I, I, I also don't trust Goro very much, the sun. So I don't know, I, uh, I would be curious to continue to see, you know, as he grows as an artist, if he can produce work, you know, up to the level of his dad. But considering the other directors that are also creating films for Ghibli, it's, it's a little bit, <laughs> It's a little bit tough for him to, to make a name for himself. Uh, obviously, um, Grave of the Fireflies is one that comes up in the Ghibli, Ghibli conversation a lot, but that same director who, uh, who did uh, the Tale of Princess Kaguya or Fairy Tale of Princess Kaguya, I don't know what the actual English uh, title of it was. Um, it's really gorgeous. It's one of the most beautiful 2D animated films I've ever seen. It was kind of a swan song before he, uh, before he passed away just a couple of years ago. And so I would, if, if you're looking away from Hayao Miyazaki, I would look towards some of the other Ghibli directors before looking at his son, unfortunately. But uh, I don't know, I will hold, I will hold judgment on the, uh, on the new uh, 3D CG uh, until I've actually seen it. Great, thank you. And we have time for a couple more questions. Um, so we have another one here from um, Courtney Van Hoosen. Uh, she asks, Sorry, um, how does the how does he how do you sorry Gabe anticipate COVID and the stay at home um, in the pandemic? Um, or how sorry one moment. <laughs> uh, how do you anticipate um, you know those uh, this whole um, coronavirus situation um, will impact uh, the increasing attention towards movie theaters and streaming services? Yeah. Uh Again, that's that's part of the real confusion of uh, why why did Japan break all of these box office records during the time of COVID? Um, I think uh, that was again last summer. I, I I would wonder if the same thing would happen now. I don't know what things are going to look like uh, this coming summer, but it's it's uh, it's definitely confusing. Um, I do think that people being home and watching more uh, streaming services is going to help Japan to finally um, embrace streaming, as I said, was my kind of prediction. I think it's still going to take a little bit of time. Like they've been trying for a long time. So just to say that it's going to happen is, is really pretty flippant. And that's why it's, I think, sort of a major thing to predict that that is going to happen within a couple of years. And yeah, I think this is definitely going to be a stepping stone along the way. Um, but the, the, the box office is, gosh, that's really anybody's guess. Um, when, uh, when The Force Awakens came out, Star Wars Episode Seven, when that broke box office records all around the world. Um, there was uh, another, another children's animated film that came out and, and beat it at the box office the opening weekend. Um, what is the name of it? It's, it was Monster, Monster something. Oh, I, I can't remember. Does anybody know? Anybody in the chat better than me on this one? <laughs> Not sure. I'll let you know if someone uh, chimes in. I'm blanking on it. But even Star Wars was defeated by, by uh, something that you know, was produced domestically and kind of targeted towards kids. It's not Monster Hunter. It's not Monster Hunter. It's was, uh, it, was it Yokai Watch? Was Yokai right Watch. Thank you so yeah, much. Yokai Watch. Yokai Watch movie. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Uh, and now it's, it's you know it's it's for kids. So yeah, Who, who's to say what's going to happen with the box office if if Yokai Watch can defeat Star Wars Episode Seven? <laughs> that was before the fans turned against the new you know the Disney trilogy too. So. <laughs> It's very hard to predict the box office, but uh, yeah, I definitely think that streaming services are going to finally, finally, finally get, uh, you know, proper mainstream attention in Japan here pretty soon. All right. And then this is the final question. Unfortunately, we don't have time to um, address all of them, but I did leave Gabe's um, LinkedIn profile. Um, the link there is in the chat. So if you want to follow him, you can continue that conversation there. Um, this last question is, uh, where can we rewatch this presentation? Oh, YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. So after this, um, the recording will be uploaded to our YouTube channel and um, we'll send out an email after the fact to um, let you know that that's online, um, as well as to kind of continue any conversation and um, get more feedback from you in case you have any other questions or suggestions for future events. Uh, we would love to, we would love to hear all of it. Um, so I believe that will be it. Thank you so much. Let's just give a quick round of applause for Gabe. This was a fantastic presentation, super insightful and so entertaining. I mean, 
even just getting to listen to the Your Name soundtrack and any Ghibli soundtrack, I think is gonna bring so much joy <laughs> to, this, um, to this presentation. So thank you so much for your time. Um, we will get to the raffle drawing, which um, I forgot to mention at the very beginning of this, but we will be having a raffle for all of the participants here. Um, so please stick around. Uh, just a couple last announcements before we get to that. Um, and uh, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, Laurasian um, does uh, currently operate three programs, uh, JOY, the Japan Outreach Initiative, JLEAP, the Japanese Language Education Assistance Program, and uh, J, uh, sorry, NPJ, uh, New Perspectives Japan. Um, and all of these programs are still ongoing despite the pandemic, trying to make everything shut down as it has done for us since last year. Um, and we in particular want to talk a little bit about um, NPJ, which is our um, exchange program. It's a summer exchange program for um, middle school, high school, and we do have some flexibility for older students as well, recent high school graduates, um, to spend two weeks in an immersive program in Japan. Um, the, it includes a, a seven-day homestay um, in a host community where you will get to participate in the local school and the activities there. Um, it's a fantastic program and we actually still have a lot um, availability for this summer's program. It's all up in the air, unfortunately, but if you are interested, please do reach out to us. Um, we operate it for both school groups. So if you are a teacher um, who is interested in bringing your students to Japan um, for this year or in the, um, oh, and thank you Vivian for um, uh, the comment there about NPJ. It is a really cool experience. Um, so like I said, we do have um, availability for school groups, for teachers to bring their students to Japan, as well as individual students. If you don't have a school group to go with, uh, we are doing what we're calling the Ronin option. So you can join unaffiliated, you'll have the same experience, you'll get to join a different school group um, of students that, uh, similar age as you still have the same um, experiential learning opportunities. And it's really, really um, such a rich program. And so if you would like to hear more about that, I'm going to post uh, our channels, our, what do you call them? Our <laughs> social um, media, social media here. And I'll actually share the um, Instagram account as well for um, our joy program, um, which is focusing more on um, cultural outreach um, between the US and Japan here. So let me post those in the chat. Um, you can learn more about NPJ there. You can also email us if you are um, if you are very interested in NPJ or if you just want to get in touch with us. Um, probably the easiest email address for NPJ is. Uh, and then for us here at Laurasian, you'll receive an email from us later on so you can continue the conversation there. Um, and uh, yeah, I think um, that is just about it. We will do the uh, raffle drawing now. You may, if you are ready, and yeah. I'm ready as well. We'll compare our list of uh, <laughs> of folks here. See what we see what we come up with. Um, I wish we had a drum roll sound effect. I don't, don't have that <laughs> quite ready. <laughs> I could play Rad Wimps again. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you, everyone, to stay with us until the end. So um, as we announced before, we have a uh, uh, dog pie today uh, for showing appreciation to participate in our program and support us. So the dog prize, the first place, let, let me show you the gift. Um, so the first place are, well, since I'm living in um, Japan, I picked like things that is kind of unique. I mean, rare, but something you know. So the first prize is a limited version haichu. Yeah. So this is like a Hokkaido flavor. And then these are three different, like I think like limited only here. So first prize haichu. And today, since it's so special, I prepared um, two more prizes, which is the second prize goes to another, uh, Japan limited um, haichu. It's like a Skittle version haichu. I've never so seen that before. Two. That is that must be yeah. new then. I don't think I've ever seen that living in Japan. <laughs> but he has like a soda or cola flavor in it. Mm -hmm. Haichu. Mini haichu. <laughs> and 
for special thank you. <laughs> I have a third place, which is everybody knows cardpiece uh, or in the US it's Calpico. Mm -hmm. Uh, so copies cal flavored candies. So um, this is going to be mail from me um, um, through the uh, the postal service, and I have to apologize in advance because of the postal service has been really slow due to the um, coronavirus uh, pandemic. So it probably takes time to deliver to you. It probably takes more than a month. Uh, so I appreciate your patience. Uh, whoever will receive this. All right. I, so I think it'll so be we, worth it. I would so like I mean, to hide you. <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah, it's not gonna, you know, get bad anything bad anytime, but so yeah. I'm in <laughs> tickets. So I'm gonna pick the number and then Sam will give the name. Drum roll. Oops. Here's a young 94. 94. We have oh hang on a second. Oh. 94. Um, Lindsay Purdue, are you still here? Lindsay Purdue, say hi either in the chat or yes, Lindsay, oh, you're yes, here. You, you got the first hey. prize. Okay. Okay. Congratulations. <laughs> congratulations, Lindsay. Yes, congratulations. All right, that we... Second prize. Second, second prize. Second prize. All right, gem roll again. Uh, the difficult number gonna 107. Ooh, 107. Oh, Anne Holgart, are you here? Anne yes, Holgart. indeed. I never win anything. Yay! How to get those Yay. Numbers. <laughs> Congratulations! <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. I guess Anne, Anne gets that prize. I think she corrected my my kanji for tenmon Forgive in the presentation. <laughs> I, but so well, no, thank, thank you very much for pointing that out. I guess that's why you get the prize today. <laughs> right. One and last we, we always... person who goes to the third place. Oh, sorry, I picked the, all the late numbers. Oh my numbers. gosh, all high numbers. Hang on a second. Uh, Zachary Ho I know. Hojna. Sorry, Ho I'm sorry if I'm getting your name wrong. Zachary Hojanki. Hojanki. Zachary, are you the, are you in? Are you in the chat still? Oh. I'm not sure if he is. Let's see. Oh yes, he's here. Fantastic. I, so congratulations. Oh, he's here. <laughs> yeah. Congratulations, Zachary. It looks like you are here. So let me make sure we get those prizes to you. We have your email addresses, so we will get um, get in touch with you um, to have those prizes mailed to you um, as soon as we can, I guess, <laughs> as <laughs> as long as the postal service is willing. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll mail it um, very soon, but it probably takes a whole a month uh, or even more. So appreciate your patience. Yes. But uh, I will contact you about your home address separately. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah great. Thank you so much, Yume. And thank you everyone for being here. It's so wonderful to see so many um, familiar names and uh, some faces as well. Um, it's been great to have you all. and. Please continue the conversation with us. We're really looking forward to continuing this series. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, I posted our um, social media accounts in the chat as well as our website. So please feel free to learn more about us there or to find out about the next um, Laurasian Institution Presents monthly event, which will be around the end of um, February. I don't think we've pinned, pinpointed a uh, date yet, but I believe we, we're aiming for the 20, 20th. Um, but check out our social media pages. We'll be posting about it there. It will be a networking event, and we hope that uh, some of you will be able to join us again for um, that or any other future events. Um, and uh, I believe that is all that we have for tonight. Um, Gabe, do you have any other last um, things to share? Or you may as well, any final comments? I just want to thank everybody again for listening to the presentation. It was a, it was a, you know, sheer pleasure for me to share this information that I, uh, that I've been, th these are the things that I think about in the shower. <laughs> as I, as I mentioned earlier, I, uh, I kind of got away from the, the film side of things in my career, but it's something that I'm always kind of thinking about and uh, never really have much of an output or a uh, way to 
share that with people without annoying them. So <laughs> setting up a, an opportunity like this was uh, was really a, a great thrill for me. So I just really appreciate everybody that came and, and listened. I, I appreciate your kind attention this evening. It was great. Yeah, no, and, and thank you. As um, as you probably saw in the chats, like um, this was a really excellent presentation. We're so grateful that you shared your insights and your knowledge with us. And we look forward to seeing all of you again at a future Laurasian Institution Presents event. So thank you very much. Have an excellent evening. Take care wherever you are in the world and uh, have a great rest of whatever you have going for today. <laughs> thank you very much, everyone. Arigatou gozaimasu. Bye. Thank you.